on this Friday morning to be joined by you, Josh Lives. Hello, Nadia Bilchik. How are you? <laughs> I am wonderful. Now, Josh Lives is a communication leader. He's a top expert on modern dads. He's written a remarkable book called All In, and he's renowned as a UN gender champion keynote speaker. Josh and I are former CNN colleagues, and Josh, have a little surprise for you. Before we have our conversation about virtual visibility, and I promised everyone a secret, and I've got my secret, and I hope you're going to share yours, I thought I would share this. All right, so people from all over the world have crowded into South Africa, and those of you watching anywhere in the world are hearing coverage from South Africa. You're probably hearing some terms that you're not familiar with, I know I am. So I asked to join me, Nadia Bilchik, our editorial producer, who is from South Africa, an anchor from South Africa. You know every piece of lingo. And I'm so excited to teach you, Josh Lev, something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that's, a, that's a first. Well, we're gonna start off with the only expression that I'm actually familiar with here, all right? Take a look at this one. How's it? Help me out. Hello, how's it? Now, how's it is a great South African expression because it's really a combination of hello, how are you? And we go, hello, how's it, Josh? Which means how are you doing? Okay. And it means hello, how are things so going in your says, life? So I meet someone that say hello, how's it? Do I say I'm fine? How's yes, it? Or do I say just you just say how's it? How's it? Just how's it? How's it? Okay. And it's everything. It just says it all, and it's universal <laughs> all right. across demographic lines, color lines. Everybody knows how's it. Gets a lot harder from here. Now I have no clue what we're talking about. What's <laughs> that? Aish is an expression of exclamation, which is either aish or aish. So let's say you see a great goal, you go okay. aish, and it just means, oh my goodness, in other words, oy vey. But what if, oh, oy vey, oy vey. Oh, see this one I can, this one I'm familiar with. Aish so if it's aish. good or it's bad, you can go aish. aish. All right, let's do the next one here. <laughs> Aina, it's Aina. so, oh, that looks, Aina, Josh, you've hurt your knee, Aina, now if I'm in pain, I go, Aina, and if you're in pain, I go, Aina. So Aina's a bad thing, it's like Aina agony. Aina is pain, agony, so, agony. Aina. Aina, all right, now help me out with this one. Lekker, now lekker in Afrikaans makes a candy or a sweet, so lekker is awesome. It's oh, awesome. awesome. It's lekker. It's so, amazing. It's fantastic. That game was lekker. That jaw lekker. was lekker. Lekker. You look lekker, my China. That's a lekker tie. Oh, you look lekker. Does she look like <laughs> lekker? Lekker. Yes, and the whole World Cup has been a lekker experience for the whole country. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, now one more, which is the ultimate stumper. Noit. No, I can't Noit. believe it. Not possible. He did that game. He did that noit. Like no way in like a bad no way. Like no way. No way, either good or bad. You All see, right. that's why these things noit. I don't believe you. You know, people say, I don't believe you. Noit. So help me out. Noit? Noit. Noit. Noit, my China, my buddy, my booty, my friend. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, there's a list of a lot more. We next post week, we have to do the South African handshake. <laughs> I have to teach you the South African handshake. That's coming next week. There are week. things that are very universal to oh my South Africa. And not South Africa, South Africa. South Africa. South Africa. I can't even say the country right. I, I posted a long list of lingo for you right here at my Facebook page, Josh Lev CNN. I'm also tweeting it out, Josh Lev CNN. Go ahead and let us know your favorite South African expressions. Nadia, thank you. Buy a donkey. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so <laughs> lost. <laughs> Josh, you know, that still makes me laugh so much. So, Josh, there's- How is it Nadia Bilchik? You are <laughs> lucky. things I want to clarify. You know, I kept saying my China. Let me explain, my China comes from British rhyming slam. So, a China plate is my mate. So plate uh, rhymes with mate. China plate, my mate. Sure. So then they abbreviate by saying my China. So my China in rhyming slam actually means my mate. So for example, apples and pears are stairs. So what do you call it? Stairs. If apples. apples and pears are stairs. That's right, because pears rhyme with stairs. Right. Apples and pears are stairs. So in rhyming slang, stairs are apples. Look it up. <laughs> so, but that always makes me smile. <laughs> That's Crazy. Now, Josh, at CNN, you were one of the first people who really understood the power of bringing social media to mainstream television. And we're talking about that segment was in 2010. But even prior to that, you were taking stories from Facebook or other things. So what made you realize that was such a trend? Hmm. So, you know, I always try to see the world in a big perspective. And when I see new communications tools, I know that there's a good chance that they're going to catch on, um, especially as we're in this communication era in which everything has to be instant. And so when I saw this democratization underway, in which all of a sudden anyone had a platform 
uh, in which they could try to get out message to masses, right, without having to enter a system of like TV or radio. Um, I had a feeling it was going to take off pretty big, and I had some really producer, some great producers at CNN who who agreed with that. But you know, when I was covering it at first, especially during this time after the um, election in Iran, when the government tried to shut down all media, and it was it was YouTube and Twitter that were people were using to get messages out. I could see the positive side of it. I could see the democratization. I could see after the earthquake in Haiti, how people were using it to find out about their loved ones. Um, but as with anything, as with TV, as with radio, as with anything, it also could have a downside. Um, and unfortunately, what we've seen over time is what always happens is that some corrupt influences get their hands on those same tools and start using them in negative ways. So the early on time is always the most exciting time when most of the really, when it's being used mostly for good stuff before, you know, some more devious people start taking advantage of it. So I've always seen you as a trendsetter and really a visionary. Josh, your, your work and your life has morphed and certainly as mine since that segment in 2010. But I think we've aged quite well. <laughs> I think we're doing okay. <laughs> certainly <laughs> wiser. <laughs> certainly I'm more tech savvy because I can now play that video on StreamYard. But Josh, really what I wanted to share today was virtual visibility. And here we are doing a live broadcast. And I want your insight, your guidance. What are the things that we know about virtual visibility? Because everybody is now on this bandwagon. Mm -hmm. But how do we skillfully cut through the clutter? Well, I'm a big fan of only doing it strategically. Um, so I say only get on a social media platform if you have a specific reason to get on that platform. So, you know, I have a lot of clients in my communications practice who will come to me and they'll say, should I have an Instagram? Should I have this? Should I have that? Um, and I say, no, not necessarily. Only if you have a reason to be there. You know, like I technically have an Instagram because I needed it, but I didn't touch it for a year until recently. Now I'm back. Um, and that's only because I had a reason for it. So. In general, your visibility, you want it to be something that you control. You should be the one decide. And so if you try to get extremely haphazard and random, just throw things out there and hope they'll catch on, um, especially now in which there are billions of people using all these platforms, it won't do much for you. But when you get strategic, you get visibility in front of the right people. So for me, the best example is LinkedIn. That's the platform that I use for most for work. And when I do a post on LinkedIn, it's not so much because I want huge numbers of people to see it, it's because I want specific people to see it. People who have certain roles at companies, people who have certain roles in the kinds of projects that I'm doing. Um, sometimes really specific individuals, so I want them to see what I'm doing. So I get very strategic about it, and I think of visibility that way. Who do I care what they think about me? And what do I want them to see? That's okay. strategy. So my purpose in having you on today was A, because it's so enjoyable to reconnect. And I also know you have such expertise that I really wanted to share with all the people that I am connected with on LinkedIn and Facebook, and I will download this onto YouTube. But for me, I'm constantly thinking, what value am I bringing others? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that this LinkedIn broadcast is being seen by potential organizations and companies who would hire you to do their communications or hire me as a keynote speaker in communication or for whoever who's watching? Let's say we have somebody who's a leadership coach here or somebody who is marketing their LinkedIn business. How do you do that? What's one practical tool? So I say there's two words to keep in mind at all times for every post, everything you do, authenticity and distinctiveness. Now, those can get thrown around easily, but one thing I have found is that people can sniff it out quickly if you're not authentic. So, um, you know, what I don't like is when people will send me a connection request on LinkedIn and in their connection request, they're saying, I do all the following things, hire me. Um, that's not an authentic connection to build connections in this era. Um, you start off authentically. So I reach out to someone if they have a role at a company and I think they're doing interesting work. And I don't ask for anything at first. Now we genuinely want to know what they're up to, what their thought processes are. Because let's say I don't end up working with them. The chances are statistically I won't. Um, but I will learn something from what they're doing and how they view their role. Um, and when you start messaging with people and reading their posts, you get a sense of whether they actually know what they're talking about or they're just trying to pack all this jargon in. And then within them, 
if it's a topic that interests me, like I do all this work around gender equality, I do work around communications, um, I look for someone who's saying something I haven't seen before. And every time I write a column, I am only writing it if I don't see anyone else having written it before. Because mm -hmm. have, why would anyone want to work with me? And what am I offering that's, as you say, of value? So if you lead with those two things, authenticity and distinctiveness, you're going to generally follow the right tracks in all your posts and everything you share. And talk about authenticity. I have a lovely comment from Lisa McClure Guthrie, who you may or may not remember, yes, but sure. I remember you well. And uh, Lisa has joined us in this conversation. And she says, when I was in South Africa and said thank you to people, the reaction was always pleasure, <laughs> not pleasure, pleasure. pleasure. So, by the way, thank you for this insight, Josh. Pleasure. Thank you. Yes, pleasure. that's exactly how they say it. Lisa so, is Lekka. Lisa is Lekka. She is a Lekka person. Really, she's just a totally authentic, great girl. Now, the other thing in South Africa, by the way, we might say girl or boy, and that's not derogatory. I've had to be very careful here in my nuances. Oh. You know, I might say, oh, George, you're such a great boy. And you'd go, but I'm a man. Oh, <laughs> I'm fine. But there are lots of things we have to take into account these days. Yes, I know. I understand. It's another sensitivity, but I yes. say that every month. Fine. And we have to be, you know, one of the things... Um, so getting back to social media, so I was thinking, I promised people when you and I spoke today a secret. What is the secret? And for me, the secret is the radio station we're all listening to right now, which is WIIFM, what's in it for me. But to bear in mind, every time you post something, WIIFY, what's in it for you? Mm -hmm. I think if every single person who posted anything always said, why am I sharing this? Yeah. So, you know, if you as really a top expert in the area of modern dads and gender champion. Mm -hmm. You're not sharing it to say, look, aren't I an incredible father of three? Because I have to say you are an incredible father of three and you and Melanie have raised <laughs> a, a, a peers on Facebook to yeah. be a wonderful family. Yeah. But am I posting to say, look at me? Or am I posting to say, this is what I learned? And I think that Josh is so key in, in any post. I'm with you, um, absolutely. And do you want to hear what is a secret to a lot of people that that I can share? Um, and that is that numbers don't matter. Numbers are irrelevant. Um, this is, you know, people get impressed by numbers, but you know, you talked earlier about how I was covering social media in the early days, and I saw the creation. There was this company called Cloud with a K that was measuring your worth based on how many followers you had. Um, the numbers of people who follow you are irrelevant. That doesn't. It really doesn't matter. What does matter is engagement. Um, and I work with people in businesses who may have a large number of followers, but when they send out information, it doesn't lead to any kind of action. Uh, and people who have smaller numbers of followers, but when they do send it out, these people take it really seriously whoops, and, uh, and take action. So to have a pragmatic effect, what matters much more than the number of people who follow you, the number of people who like a post, um, really is the uh, intended action in their lives or for your business. So you can have a huge number of followers and not be succeeding in your line of work. Um, and you can have a much smaller number of followers and be very successful because the people who are listening to you care and take action and want to hire you, want to work with you, depending on what you're going for. Um, so don't get taken in by people's numbers. Don't think they're inherently impressive, especially in places like Twitter where people have a long history of buying followers. That those numbers, yeah, this is a secret, I guess, but those numbers mean nothing. So let's talk about Clubhouse then. Would you say Clubhouse falls into the same category? And for those people who are not really familiar with Clubhouse, mm -hmm. won't you share a bit? And I know that Clubhouse is now available on Android, correct? Mm -hmm. I know all of this because my neighbor is one of the builders of the software. Really? Oh, exciting. Yes. I didn't know so that. It gives me all the inside scoop on what's happening with Clubhouse. That's but I want your thoughts. Again, I'm very wary of being involved in things that are mind suckers. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of time. Is it really useful? Are the conversations really valuable? But I know for some people, Clubhouse really has been. 
Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of rules that you can follow if you're a person who gets caught up in lots of platforms, like limiting yourself to an hour a day total when you will do any social at all and putting aside the rest, turning off notifications on your phone. I mean, we can talk about that. It's very easy to lose a lot of time to get caught up and sometimes to go down these rabbit holes in which you're just like obsessed with a topic. And meanwhile, it's doing nothing for you or your life or the cause you care about. You're just arguing with strangers. Um, Clubhouse is an example of what I was saying that you should only join if you have a reason to. So even though it was taking off, I didn't join. Plus, I'm a droid guy all the way, not Apple. So even when it became available, I didn't join until uh, recently because I have a client and friend who is very active on this. She's fantastic. Denise Hamilton, she's a star on it. And she wanted to have a specific conversation that was about a topic I care about. A which lot. was? It was about fatherhood and gender equality, which is, um, so I run two businesses. One is communications, but the other one, which you can see at my website, is about fatherhood and gender equality. In order for businesses to give women an equal playing field, an equal shot, they have to start treating men as equal caregivers at home. And they don't. And that's based on old mad men assumptions. So I work with businesses to change policies and cultures to treat men as equal caregivers. And uh, Denise wanted to have a conversation about that with people who are specifically interested in that. So I had every reason at that moment to get on Clubhouse and go do it. And it was very productive. Productive. And then again, the other day, she had me in a conversation. These are with people who care about the issue, who I knew could benefit from it. And I could benefit from hearing their stories and sharing them. So, so how did you meet? And was it one of those that you met Cat Cole? Was it one of those that I do what? That you met Cat, the co-author yes. of my book, right? Yes. So Cat, hi, hi, Cat, if you're with us. Yes, it was, yes. At, it was at the start of that that Kat, um, who was a big star on that platform, uh, business leader, she came in and reminded us that I had, we had met through you, that the yes. three of us had talked, and I know you've worked with her, uh, written with her. And um, yeah, she joined and gave very valuable insight. So that's a perfect example of only going to a platform if you have a specific reason to. So I personally am not looking to, at this point, grow a huge following on Clubhouse. I, As I start to grow my presence there, I will look for people specifically interested in what I'm interested in and only follow them. And what some people, I don't want to trash the idea of having a lot of followers. If someone does it well, if you have a lot of followers, but you've done it the right way, then these are followers who care and will be active and will be engaged. It's just that to me, the measure of success is that the actual impact you're having, as opposed to, uh, you know, the concept of cloud and looking impressive because of numbers. That I think that is so important, Josh. So Clients for you in terms of both individual thought leaders, right, who want to reach the right people and get published in the right places, you strategize with them and businesses as well. Yeah. So the first piece of advice is have a strategy, which sounds like a BLO, a blinding light of the obvious. Mm, it's not. So many people, you're right. It's not. Um, it's interesting you say BLO because I often think of it as flying blind. Uh, people often are flying blind into this arena. It is uh, confusing. And, you know, we're living in an era in which people are pressured to brand themselves. Even employees of a company often uh, get this sense that in order to work their way up the ranks, they have to brand themselves internally in a certain way. And often that can be through their social platforms. What they say about their company externally might impress certain people internally. So they get the sense of a brand. Um, people go into this not knowing what to do and they are flying blind. And so when I say have a specific strategy, I can really mean tuning out all the noise and figuring out where am I trying to get? Am I looking to increase this business? Am I looking to, people say, dress for the job you want? Or is there a new job I'm looking for? And how can I dress myself metaphorically through these social posts? Um, am I just, am I an activist who's looking to make a difference? in a major cause and if so uh just getting into every spat everywhere is not the way to do it there are ways over time to build those connections so figure out what your actual goals are and then start from zero and say okay in order to get there here's how i need to get there study some people who have done similar things and you know beyond that it's a lot of what i talk with my clients about what articles are we going to publish what stories are we going to tell in the media what posts are going to take you from here to there and if it does not meet any of your goals don't say it, don't post it, don't do it, don't waste the time, don't get involved. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And have that thought process. So 
breaking down things. I mean, Facebook people are using to share the highlights of their lives. That's usually not a business platform. The way I break it down, and I'd love your thoughts, I say Facebook is a cocktail party. Um, LinkedIn is a business meeting. Twitter is a soapbox. Clubhouse is... Like ham radio? I don't know. <laughs> ham radio. But again... Mm. Even for Facebook, though, Josh, I feel that there's a sense of, you know, somebody, I was walking with a friend this morning and she was saying somebody just posted a huge diamond ring of theirs. It's my anniversary. And I said, for me, a thoughtful post would be manage 10 years of marriage. My advice to you is, or we've come a long way. I just feel a sense of some value in what you're sharing, some sense of who is reading this and why are they interested? You know, the famous line goes, we compare the highlights of other people's Facebook lives to our real lives. How do we shift? How do we get people just being thoughtful? And of course, mm. you know, I'm saying this, I have understood that social media helps with self-promotion. Absolutely. And, you know, if I've got an interesting class or talk, I will post it. But I'm always thinking, if I'm posting that I'm doing a hybrid session, I'm posting, this is what I learned from doing a hybrid session. Otherwise, right. why do you care? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that um, because one thing that we can talk about is that I take, on Facebook, I take very seriously the little button that allows you to determine who your audience is going to be and what your audience okay. can do. So yes. um, I do use Facebook, you're a friend. So I do use Facebook for, um, you know, uh, here and there, not super serious stuff, but for updates, once in a while pictures of the kids. Um, and I have my settings so that only friends can see it. And I take my friends list seriously. I mean, at the end of each calendar year, every December, I go through my friends list and I remove people from being in the friends section if we haven't had any authentic connections at all, if um, you know they haven't reached out, if I haven't heard back, mm -hmm. if I just don't feel connected to them anymore. Because I think, okay, who do I actually want to see pictures of my kids? Uh, now, I understand, and, and people should know this in terms of safety, that anything you put online could be seen by anyone technically. Someone opens it, leaves it open, grabs a snapshot, whatever. It can happen. But So I, I take that seriously. And then I have a separate list of people in which you can just do like some friends, like only some of your friends see it. You go in there. And I do have things that I post publicly. And those are things for work, for major causes that I care about. Um, and if there's something controversial about it, then I will post it publicly, but also go in and remove the ability to comment. Facebook has a system in which the only people who can comment, you can click, so the only people who, you can, who can comment are people whom you specifically mentioned in your post, um, and no one else can. That way they can share the link, they can send it to their friends, but I'm not gonna hear from the riffraff about all their opinions about everything. Now, so, Josh, I always <laughs> learn so much from you. I don't know if anybody who's joining us, either watching this live or take you or that, I certainly didn't. Mm. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I can post into the chat afterwards if it's helpful, but basically on any given post, you click in the top right corner where it gives you options, edit audience. And then within that, you go to uh, the options about who the audience is and who can comment. And you That's, know, That is so powerful. So. I think the point is, I offered, you know, virtual visibility. Virtual visibility is good for business if it's done strategically, is right. what you're saying. And it's being thoughtful in everything, whether it's your Facebook, your Instagram, your Twitter. You can't just be posting. Right. Um, yes. And it, every post matters. Every post is a reflection of your brand. Um, now, I will tell you one thing I do that might sound like it's a numbers game, but it actually isn't. I and all of my speeches, every single speech before every company I talk to, every organization, I say the one rule I have is that everyone is required to go on LinkedIn right now and connect with me. Um, now, the reason I do that is that LinkedIn offers a kind of, for me, authentic connections that don't exist anywhere else. And LinkedIn, um, once I have these connections, and next time I'm going to a city, let's say, you know, post pandemic, I'm booked in wherever it is, Minneapolis, I can just go in and search who's in Minneapolis, tell them I'm coming out to Minneapolis. Do you want me to come do something for your company as well? But only if I've also been messaging with them where they've sent me their questions, they've sent me what interests them, they did a recommendation, I did one for them. There's a, there's a relationship there. Um, and I much prefer doing that instead of doing cold reach out to other companies saying, hi, here's who I am. I'll be in town. Do you want me? Um, that is great. That it's a warm reach out. So that is a place. I'm not saying that your authentic connections have to be great friends. 
I'm saying that within a platform, you determine a strategy for what that authenticity will be and who your audience is that you're willing to have authentic relationships with. And if you follow that, and then you think, okay, these folks, what will be of value to them in an authentic way and distinctive coming from me? If you don't have anything, just stay quiet. If you do have something great, offer it up. That's just so important. The, the you've just articulated that perfectly and you know i often get asked about the recommendations how important are they and something that i find helpful after talk and i don't know if you do this is if someone says that was amazing loved your presentation depending obviously on who it is but i recently for example did something for public relations society of america medical affairs they wrote back a really great note i said thank you because that's a big deal individual would be so grateful if you could write that as a LinkedIn recommendation. Because if they just send it to you in private chat or in an email, it's not as visible. So if we think of networking as being a go-giver as much as a go-getter, that's something nice to do for the people who have assisted you, is write them a LinkedIn recommendation. Oh. I'm with you. I'm glad you said that. Yes, I'm shameless about that. After every event or a project or a consulting project with a company, I ask uh, at the most two people from that company uh, to do a recommendation on LinkedIn. And that helps with all these people watching my speech. After every speech, same thing. I'll reach out to a couple and say, hey, would you do this? And I'm sure you know this. Viewers might not. Um, what you do inside of LinkedIn is you go to recommendations and then or you go to the person's name and then you click the options and you click request recommendations. And then within that, you tell them what to recommend you for, for which role you have listed on your profile. Um, and then that's very helpful. And then what I do is I double up on that. So once we have okay, the- that friend, very quickly, and I think that is extremely sorry. valuable. I always just ask for a recommendation, but you take it a step further. So yes. not only ask for recommendation, but you make it very easy for the person because- yeah, because you want them to waste as little time as possible. I always say one or two sentences is plenty. Um, and then LinkedIn gives you the opportunity to approve it or not approve it. And then once it's up, my web people put that as under recommendations on my website as well. So it, it serves a double purpose. Josh, as I say, and I say it every time, I have known Josh now for, I think it's about 15 years. I mean, you were going on air on CNN. I had transitioned from doing some shows for CNN International and then was doing guest producing at CNN Domestic. And I remember there was Josh Lives. And one of my favorite memories is my brother calling me in LA and saying, Josh Lives is so good, such great advice and guidance. I said, yes, I know Josh Lives. Oh, so it's great. amazing, you know, fast forward. And you, there's so many things to talk to you about because there's all in your book. So in terms of the pandemic and families who've had to be together, do you think that's improved how fathers have, have you seen any trends in that area? Yes, um, fathers are more involved, have the chance to be more involved. You know, the short version of the big picture is that fathers are the most misunderstood part of the American family. Um, you know, I was a fact checker on air doing the things your brother liked. And um, I was not just fact checking politicians and pundits, but I also turned my sights on, on the American family as I became a father. And I found that all the stereotypes are wrong. Men are not you know, lazy at home. We're not getting more relaxation time. Men and women are putting in equal hours on behalf of their families. But for men, more of the hours are in paid work. For women, more are um, at home. And a lot of that's because of workplace pressures that prevent men from having an equal shot at being caregivers at home. So um, what I have found during the pandemic is that because so many people have been home, men have had the chance to do more at home. Now, there are still some sexist bosses out there who believe that male employees, even working from home, should be available 24 seven, whereas women should be the ones handling you know, the children. Um, but bosses are having to wake up to how sexist that is. And little by little, uh, men are also fighting for the right to be equal caregivers at home. So we're moving in the right direction. And I hope that we keep going there, even in this new hybrid era that we're entering into now. And that is going to be our next conversation. Let's do that soon, where we talk about your advice and guidance for a hybrid situation. But Josh Lives, thank you so much. And if you happen to have just joined us, in Clubhouse, we call it resetting the room. I've had a wonderful conversation to Josh Lives about virtual visibility and the mistakes that people make. And his secret is to be strategic. And I spoke about just be intentional. What is in it for the other person? 
this recording will be available on my YouTube. Um, Josh is available at joshlevs.com. He is a master virtual communication strategist. I highly recommend him. And Josh, I always say what I love about doing these sessions is very few people could afford this level of consultation. And I just had you on for nearly 30 minutes of your very valuable consultation time. Okay. So appreciate it. And my last thought to everybody as you embark on this weekend is just, and then I want you to share yours, is just as you're about to post anything, what is in it for the other person? And also, maybe you need a moment where scrolling through other people's things is not serving you. Let's just be intentional. I try and be very intentional. Is this helping me or hurting me? Your thoughts, Josh? Mm. Oh, I'm absolutely with you on all of that. My thoughts are that Nadia is fantastic. <laughs> and yes, always be intentional, be authentic, be distinctive, and do not feel pressure to speak on a platform that you have no strategy for. Just let other people do that. You're fine. You're fine without that one. <laughs> that is just my, that is so liberating. So I say for those South Africans who have joined us, it was a lecker seeing you. It was a total jaw. That means it was wonderful seeing you. It was a total party. Then you say, buy a donkey. Say that. Buy a donkey. And I go, pleasure. 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 South Africa, pleasure. thanks pleasure. for joining us. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure, pleasure, Josh. To be continued. Thank you so much for your invaluable time. Yeah,